I wanted to know what it felt like to, to have a blood connection with someone. Someone broke into your house. You were attacked. It's becoming more apparent that not only is Gabriel getting stronger, he's becoming more malicious. If his strength and ability continue to grow at this rate, we will no longer be able to contain him. I've never seen anything quite like it. Who are you? You know who I am. You're gonna be saying I'm only in your head. You've been a bad, bad boy, Gabriel. <sighs> Malignant is your worst nightmare. Whenever the mood strikes and I'm looking for a spooky, atmospheric, midnight movie to deliver on the thrills and chills, I'll turn to Malignant to satisfy the craving. It's a movie that showcases every one of James Wan's directorial sensibilities and combines what we love about each of his films. It's got the sleepy and somber look of Insidious, the cold and foggy lighting of Dead Silence, and the utter brutality of Saw, while also giving us the incredible cinematography and unsettling horror of The Conjuring. There's a specific feeling that Malignant invokes which makes you feel as intrigued as you are afraid. It's a specific sleepwalking through your house at 3am energy which brings you into a lucid state as you meander through your dreams. In a lot of ways, it makes you feel like the entire movie takes place in the further dimension from Insidious. You're not quite asleep, yet you're not quite awake. You're just drifting through the unfolding mystery and hoping to wake up. It's a film that I was worried would only be entertaining once, as the mystery of the film is lost once the twist has been revealed. But I've seen this movie a handful of times since its release in 2021, and for some reason, I like it even more now than I did originally. And of course, I had to understand why. So, what better way to figure out why Malignant is such a standout film while also giving it the praise that it deserves than to put the movie under the Joe Blow horror microscope and figure out once and for all why Malignant is your worst nightmare? I'm Kier Gomes with Joe Blow Horror, and you're watching Deconstructing. <laughs> Malignant is the story of Maddie Mitchell, a shy woman who is plagued by unexplainable visions of brutal and violent murders. As Maddie aims to discover why she's having these visions, she slowly uncovers a deep and disturbing web of mystery that reveals that she is closer to these deaths than she ever could have expected. Like some kind of, um, like a, 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 like a, a psychic bond. See, the first half of this movie is shrouded in mystery. We only know what Maddie knows. That drifting feeling from the opening act slowly becomes an inescapable hunt for the truth and by the time the twist is introduced, the entire viewing experience has changed. The film was directed by James Wan and written by Akila Cooper. While everyone's favorite James Wan movie is a matter of personal opinion, I must say that this movie is the most visually appealing James Wan movie to date. With the use of intensely saturated and dramatic lighting, contrasting colors, Colors, which we'll talk about, and sweeping and grand cinematography, this movie is exactly the visual stimulation that you want from a classic horror film. And as we do on the show, we're going to break down Malignant into our four key categories to fully explain this movie. First, we're going to look at the origin, where I talk about the movie from a pre-production standpoint. Then we'll get into the movie's legacy, which should be fairly easy considering the film is not only recent, but also probably not getting a sequel anytime soon. Then I'll test your horror brain with some trivia and give you some fun facts about the film before we get into The X Factor, where I talk about the unsung details of the movie that make it such an icon status worthy film. We're just getting started. So, if you're ready, then follow me into the darkness, and don't forget to drop a like on the video, and let's hit play on Malignant. Now, to get the obvious out of the way, this movie shares some plot elements in common with the cult classic horror franchise, Basket Case. 
Basket Case is the story of Dwayne, a shy man who carries around his disfigured adjoined twin Belial in a wicker basket after surgically being separated as babies. When Belial gets a chance, he aims to track down and brutally murder the doctors who separated the two. While Basket Case focuses more on the relationship between the siblings, Malignant uses the adjoined twins angle as a twist to the story which would explain why Madison is able to see these murders so vividly despite apparently not being the killer. I see them as they're happening, like I'm having visions. Spoiler alert, but this movie reveals that Maddie was actually born with a twin brother attached to her at the head with a shared brain. But doctors attempted to kill and remove the twin as it was seen as a malignant parasitic tumor. And as it turns out, Maddie's asshole boyfriend knocking her head against the wall awakens her brother from his dormant sleep and causes him to use Maddie's body to commit murder against those he feels have wronged him. This makes the final act of the movie a whole other animal. Maddie can't possibly escape a brain that she shares with her homicidal adjoined brother. You'll always be stuck with me! Sooner or later, I will get out! I know. The screenplay for the film was written by Akila Cooper, and Juan was set to direct as early as 2019. Cooper does not state Basket Case as inspiration for the film, but she did say that her fascination with medical anomaly horror was partially in credit to Edward Mordake, which was her inspiration for Gabriel, Maddie's long dormant adjoined twin brother who is revealed to be the one committing these violent crimes. Michael Burgess was one cinematographer on the film, as well as many others, and he pulled out all of the stops for Malignant. This movie literally looks like every frame is meant to be wallpaper for your laptop. There's dynamic camera movements, special rigs, meaningful blocking, and for God's sakes, would you just look at this? The movie was given a budget of roughly $40 million, and since a good portion of the movie takes place in the same three locations, the budget feels big and the film looks expensive. I love it so much. Now, this film was shot in 2019 before the first round of COVID-19 shut studios down. So the making of the film was unaffected by the world's events, but the movie's release is where it all went to hell. Which reminds me, let's get into the film's legacy. Okay, let's address the disgusting parasitic elephant that's attached to the back of our heads. This movie was a flop. It made less than $35 million at the box office and essentially has become one of the many great movies to go straight to max for streaming. Now, am I saying that this movie is too good for that? Well, yes. Malignant feels like James Wan coming home. He brought back the elevated reality lighting and the fog that created the otherworldly atmosphere. He had the sets dressed to look like gothic, low-light, almost Tim Burton-esque atmospheres, and he gave us that signature red and blue light combination that became a staple of the Insidious franchise. But let's be honest, whenever we talk about Malignant, we talk about the reveal. The reason I love this movie so much is because even after knowing that Maddie's visions are really just memories of her twin brother going on killing sprees while she's asleep, the movie is endlessly still rewatchable. Usually, something like this would hurt your ability to revisit the film, because once you know the twist, the rematch holds no mystery. But the brilliant thing that Juan did with this movie is leave enough clues and breadcrumbs in the movie to make revisiting it more interesting. You can kind of see little context clues that spell it out right in front of you throughout the whole thing, but in a way that still makes you feel engaged. No fingerprints, but all the hand patterns are upside down, like our perp was hanging from the ceiling. For those of you that have seen Malignant, let's not pretend that the scene where Maddie is in an overnight jail does not give you the fucking creeps. <laughs> While Malignant didn't do gangbusters at the box office, the movie has actually been praised by many notable celebrities who enjoyed it. Nicolas Cage went on record and stated that the movie was his favorite horror film of the year, and even the father of horror himself, Stephen King, tweeted about the picture, calling it, quote, brilliant. 
tell. Even Kier Gomes from the hit Joe Blow horror series Deconstructing went on record 10 minutes ago saying this. Malignant is your worst nightmare. And did you know that the scenes that show Gabriel walking or running were done for real? Gabriel, of course, is attached to the back of Maddie's head, so when he wants to move forward, the actor has to move backwards, and rather than achieving this with visual effects, production hired Marina Mazipa, a Ukrainian actress and contortionist who could create these unsettling movements. And before we get into the X Factor, let's see if you can answer this question. Which popular alternative pop song was used as an instrumental theme for Malignant? Was it A. Zombies by the Cranberries B. Losing My Religion by R.E.M. C. Where Is My Mind by the Pixies Or D. Bullet with Butterfly Wings by the Smashing Pumpkins Comment your answer down below. Okay folks, here we are. For this episode, I could go into every detail of the visual aesthetic of this movie, and each one of those elements could be the X Factor in my opinion. I mean, I could literally just put this movie on mute and have it playing in the background on loop while I work. I'm not kidding, I'm doing it right now. I would say that the best aspect of the movie is the insane design of Gabriel and the humanoid look of the character, but the entire twist of the movie kind of relies on this dude looking as disgusting and scary as possible. I mean, either way, look at this disgusting bastard. You don't deserve your body. I can use it better than you. But in the end, the X Factor of Malignant exists only on the rewatch. It's the thing that takes this from being another decent James Wan film and shoots it to the top of his movie catalog. And that thing is the relationship between the hero and the villain. It was right in front of me all along. Maddie represents a person who's broken from the very beginning. She's in a toxic relationship that directly results in Gabriel being awakened after years of being dormant. Gabriel not only seeks revenge against the doctors that tried to destroy him, but he's also a parasitic presence in Maddie's life that prevents her from moving forward. See, Maddie wants to be a mother, as she believes it'll make her feel whole. But while dormant, Gabriel had been eating her babies from the inside to survive, causing multiple miscarriages. And this represents the unfortunate and all too common case of a person who wants desperately to feel complete while someone or something toxic in their past does all they can to deny that feeling. And in the end, Maddie isn't free of this relationship, this obligation, this tumor. She's instead cursed with all of the damage that came from her evil twin. In the end, it's a story that reminds us that ignoring what plagues us is not a cure but just one of the many ways to sabotage our own happiness. And I don't know about you, but that is my worst nightmare. It's time we cut out the cancer. I'm scared for Dalton. I'm scared of this house. I don't like my room. There's something wrong with this place. I'm not imagining it. I can feel it. It's, it's like a sickness. Yeah, you may be a superhero, but you're not invincible. They are all trying to get inside of his physical body simply because they, they crave life. 
When you're recommending a spooky movie to your friends, how would you get them interested in Insidious? How would you describe what it's about? Maybe you'd go straight to the obvious and explain that it's another haunted house movie with demons and kids making creepy drawings. Or maybe you'd describe it as a story about a kid who gets caught up in a paranormal mind wrestle with a monster who wants to possess his body. In either case, you'd be recommending a movie that sounds appealing but lacks a certain uniqueness. See, Insidious is a far more interesting film than we often give it credit for. It's a creepy and haunting and even, at times, deep exploration of fear and trauma that is often overlooked. Now, of course, this movie quickly became a franchise, and with that came the unfortunate case of this movie being viewed more as an entry in the catalog and less as an individual piece with its own unique aspects and ideology. This is a movie that, despite its PG-13 rating, explores dark themes that you may not see upon your first watch. But hey, that's what I'm here for. We're gonna break down Insidious to its core and figure out exactly why all these years later, we're still afraid of things that go bump in the night. I'm Keir Gomes with Joe Blow Horror, and you're watching Deconstructing. Insidious is the story of Josh and Renee, a suburban family with three young kids, Dalton, Foster, and Callie. The family has just moved into a new home, and after Dalton discovers something strange in the house, he falls into a coma as his parents begin experiencing ghostly terrors of their own and go to an infamous local medium for help. They need the help of Elise, a paranormal psychic, to send Josh into the ghost dimension and save Dalton's life. But what they're about to go up against is much deeper than anyone could have thought it to be more malevolent and have a more insidious agenda now i'm gonna talk more about what i think this movie is really about but before i can do that we're gonna need some context this movie is fairly easy to break down thanks to our foolproof formula where i explain the origin of how the movie came to be then of course we'll get into the legacy that the film has left which in this case is quite a big one given the number of films there are in this series and then we'll cleanse your palate with some trivia before we get into the X Factor, which is the segment where we celebrate the unique, accidental successes of this movie. So if you're ready, then stay out of the attic, and don't forget to like the video for the best in horror content. And let's hit play on Insidious. Insidious was directed by legendary horror director James Wan, who you would know as the first director of Saw and the underrated puppet horror film Dead Silence. Now, who's the dummy? So James Wan, while enjoying working on Saw and ultimately being happy with the film, felt that Saw's extreme violence and bloodiness may cause certain studios and producers to shy away from working with him. He wanted to show Hollywood that he could make other kinds of movies, and to do it, he decided to take on Insidious as a way to create a scary experience for audiences, while also lacking the blood and guts that studios fear. Now, Saw was made for only about $1.2 million, which for a film that mostly takes place in a single room with a handful of cast and crew makes sense. But Insidious was made with a reported budget of only $1.5 million, but has many more set pieces, a larger cast of characters, and tons of practical and visual effects. So, the budget being almost the same as Saw, but having seemingly more visual ambition would prove to be a challenge for James Wan to overcome. The filmmakers overcame this obstacle by shortening the shooting schedule to just 21 days and working long hours to get the coverage they needed. Star of the movie, Patrick Wilson, has recalled the intense shooting schedule of the movie and went on record saying, quote, we had long days, and a lot of pages a day, and we didn't get a lot of coverage or rehearsal. But luckily, the benefit of doing a movie that's not on a big budget, and the reason it's usually done like that, is so if the filmmakers feel like, okay, we're not gonna sacrifice anything on screen, which I don't think they have, it lets them have complete control, so we were in good hands. Lee Wannell wrote the script for the movie, and of course, we at Joe Blow Horror love this combination of writer and director. While it seems the two have been busy working on their own projects lately, we hope that it's in the cards for them to team up once again on a new and frightening tale. Wannell wrote the script for Insidious, unsure of what the rating would be, but during the filming in 2010 in Los Angeles, it became clear that the muted violence and lack of goo would warrant this film a PG-13 rating, which would make it much more accessible to young audiences. 
I was a kid once too, believe it or not. You're old now. And speaking of young audiences, Lee Wanell was only about a year into being married at the time he wrote Insidious, which I think speaks to what this movie is really about. Josh, played by Patrick Wilson, plays a father who works too much but cares for his wife and kids in his own way, usually offering logic or humor as a response to the horrors ensuing in their house and eventually their other house. But the character of Josh may have something more in common with Wanell, and we will definitely be getting into that soon. When Insidious was released in theaters in 2011, it was a smash fucking hit. The movie, as we know, was made for about 1.5 million, and its release saw a return of $100 million all in. I remember seeing this movie in theaters and noticing the audience was mostly made up of teenagers. And as such, there is quite a bit of hype among fans of the film for the new Insidious movie, which will revisit the original story and family, and will be debut directed by Patrick Wilson. The film, of course, was such a success that it spawned all of these subsequent films, and some of them have some merit of their own, but that's a topic for another show. I think what people remember most about this movie is The Demon. You know the one. Also, does anyone else think that this emoji looks almost exactly like my man right here? I have more to say about this too, but that's a trivia topic, so hang on. Now, why is Insidious still in the conversation? And why make another one? I think the true legacy that this film leaves behind is the endless potential of the further, which is basically a dimension where ghosts and demons reside waiting for their chance to cross over. They are all trying to get inside of his physical body simply because they, they crave life. This movie only scratched the surface of the unlimited curiosities that live in between worlds, and fans keep coming back to see where this story can go next. And there isn't much else to say about the legacy, and let's be honest, you're all itching for some trivia. Did you know that the demon, well, this creepy bastard is actually played by Joseph Bishara, who you probably don't recognize, but he's actually the composer who provided the spine-chilling score to this movie. The musical themes and piano strikes add more than jump scares to the story. They create a sense of anxiety, dread, and otherworldliness that will make you shudder at every corner. And before we move on to my theory on what Insidious is really about, let's see if you can answer this question. Which actor was originally asked to play the role of Josh before Patrick Wilson was hired? Was it A, Wes Bentley, B, Ethan Hawke, C, Bradley Cooper, or D, Rory Cochran? Comment your answer down below. Alright my friends, here we are, the final showdown between me and this movie. Picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah, but words are worth a thousand words too. Fans of the show will know that I love this segment. I take pride in finding deeper meanings in things that seemingly exist as a trope with no originality. And for today's episode, I thought long, and I thought hard, and I wanted to truly understand what makes Insidious so watchable and so satisfying. And instead of teasing it for another five minutes while I praise the incredible lighting, fun cinematography, and incredible set design, considering the film's budget, instead I'm just gonna get right to it and tell you, once and for all, what I think Insidious is really about. I want you to know this is what I believe, and it may contradict a previous medical diagnosis, but so, I mentioned earlier that writer Lee Wanell wrote the script around the same time that he was a newlywed. Well, at the time, Wanell didn't have any kids, but being that he was freshly married, he and his wife may have been kicking around the idea of starting a family. Now, maybe I'm reaching, but hear me out. Insidious kind of has Dalton as our main character, in that the entire story and conflict within it are based around him. But the real main character of this piece is Josh Lambert, a teacher and father who loves his family but is dealing with his own internal anxiety. Josh isn't selfish, but he certainly seems to be preoccupied with his own fears, and he doesn't seem to be communicating them. 
God, stop saying that, okay? I don't avoid stressful situations. I'm just dealing with them my own fucking way. And it's revealed near the end of the movie that Josh has been suppressing memories of his own encounters with evil spirits as a child. And he's had more experience with the further than he could even remember. But why would this be written into Lee wan ls story? Sure, it makes a good device to get Josh into the next dimension to save Dalton, but let's face it, it's a horror movie. They could have written any excuse into this script that dabbles in the otherworldly, but they chose, Lee wan ell chose, to highlight Josh's childhood trauma in a moment where the story is at its most unpredictable. Is it possible that Lee wan ell secretly wrote a movie about his own fear of being a father? It's no accident that your son is a gifted traveler. The ability was handed down to him by his father. Look, on the surface, I accept that Josh is just your prototypical horror film husband who seems uninvolved in his family and is continuously gaslighting his wife because he doesn't understand the concept of scary shit happening in his own house. But if we look beyond that, we see a character who works too hard and avoids his family, and who has unresolved trauma from his past that seems to be now tormenting his young son. And to conquer that emoji demon, to save Dalton's life, he must confront his own haunting fear. Hell, Lee has even publicly talked about his struggles with anxiety and mental health, and I think it's fair to say that maybe he projected some of those fears, inadvertently or otherwise, into his own art. The movie deals with astral projection, and it shows it as basically being an out-of-body experience. This, to me, sounds a lot like a panic attack, or at the very least those haunting nightmares you have where you're flying above your own body. Anxiety can sometimes make you feel like you're in a bad dream, and I think it's safe to say, so does this movie. So, is Insidious really a movie about a person who's deathly afraid of having kids because they're secretly afraid that their own trauma, their own irrational fears, their own baggage, their own bullshit would be passed down to their children? Could it be that Juanel was really journaling his own thoughts into a story about demons and ghosts? Or would you still describe it as just a movie where a kid does creepy drawings? If you had $700,000 and less than three weeks to shoot a horror movie with your friends, how do you think it would go? Would the limited budget and schedule cripple your creativity? Or would it inspire something inside you that would lead to one of the most acclaimed genre films of the 21st century? Well, why don't we just ask these guys? No, we had similar interests. James was talented and I was interested in being talented. So I... <laughs> I, uh, I, I shared in his life. He let, me, he let me come into his world, which was fantastic. James Wan and Lee wan -El have individually carved out their own impressive corners in the film industry, but while these days the filmmakers are working on giant studio projects and getting rich, they were once just a pair of film students who just wanted to make their first movie. A movie that would draw inspiration from the explosive success of the now iconic found footage film, The Blair Witch Project. A movie with a villain that has since become an icon, and even recently, a hero? I still have a lot of work that needs to be done. <laughs> Folks, it's the Halloween season, and like many of you, I've been on a long bender of watching horror movies that are on my ever-growing list of seasonal rewatches. Among the titles that I just can't seem to skip is 2004's Saw. But before having sequels and spin-offs galore, Saw started as a small mystery thriller made by filmmakers with so much unique style and flair that resonated with audiences so much that the film is now hailed as a modern horror classic. 
To overcome something, you have to understand what a perfect engine it is. So, today we're gonna dive deep into the Book of Saw, revisit the first film, and determine exactly why this gritty, low-budget bathroom production is so important to horror fans almost 20 years later. I'm Kier with Joe Blow Horror, and you're watching Deconstructing. Most people are so ungrateful to be alive. Imagine this, you wake up in a bathtub full of water and quickly realize that you have no idea where you are or why you're there. There's another person in the room with you, two actually. One is alive and one is dead. The living one is chained to the wall and you soon realize that you're chained to the wall too. And the game is simple, get out. I want to play a game. That's the plot of Saw, a clean and simple story about two men desperate to escape their captivity at any cost. This movie stands out as being quite an attention grabber, despite the incredibly small scope of the tale being told. It's like how we all love 12 Angry Men because the specific and small story is carried by dynamic and interesting performances and dialogue. Now, I'm not saying that the performances in this movie are anywhere near the status or prestige of 12 Angry Men. but what this movie lacks in talent in front of the camera, it makes up for with the directorial style and editing of James Wan, mixed with the sharp twist ending provided by Wan L. It was a very fresh movie at the time. My name is very fucking confused, what's your name? So, as usual, today we're going to break down this movie by way of our four key categories. First, we'll discuss the movie's origin and how it went from idea to production. Following that up, we'll get into the film's legacy, where we talk a little bit about the massive waves that this movie has made over the years. Then we'll get into a bit of trivia, so make sure you're studied up on your Saw lore, and we'll end it all off by talking about the movie's X Factor, where I'm looking for the one small thing that takes this movie from being just another bloody good time at the movies to being an iconic horror film that's well worth its weight in guts. So if you're ready, then keep your back to the wall, and don't forget to drop a like on the video. And let's hit play on Saw. Well, do you have any idea how you got here? No. As we know, Saw is the brainchild of James Wan and Lee wan -El. The duo met in film school, and after graduating, they wanted to get to work on their first feature. They were able to come up with a working budget of about $30,000, which quickly proved to be too small of a stack for these guys to work with. So, they started by shopping the script around to Australian producers and almost got a deal, but it fell through. It actually wasn't until they were on their very last leg that they decided to spend a little bit of money to get to lot. Los Angeles and shop their movie around Hollywood. And these guys are pros, and even in the beginning, they showed that they were serious about their idea. They went as far as to package their script and pitch it with an accompanying DVD short film that would showcase the jaw trap, which has become an iconic piece of imagery for the Saw franchise. The short film provided a sample of Juan's visual style, most importantly, but it also showed the ambitious designs of the traps. Think of it like a reverse bear trap. Here, I'll show you. It was important for Juan and Juanel to work together on the film if it were to end up getting funded. James Wan was set on directing the film and not interested in selling the script and then just walking away. He quoted, Lee and I just loved the project so much and we wanted a career in filmmaking, so we stuck to our guns and said, look guys, if you want the project, we're coming on board. Lee has to act in it and I have to direct it. And just like they'd hoped, the actor-director duo ended up getting the money and the jobs that they needed to make their movie. In fact, when producer Greg Hoffman saw the short film, he and his partner started a sister company to their production house, Evolution Entertainment, and that became the iconic Twisted Pictures, which we've seen at the top of just about every installment. Despite speculation that Wanell played the lead character as a budgetary restriction, Wanell always wanted to play the lead and was actively pursuing a career in acting at the time. I know he's not the best actor in this movie, but whatever, it gets a pass. How do I know you're telling the truth? You could be the one who put me in this room! The movie shot in just 18 days, with only one set being built. 
the bathroom, and the rest were being done either on location or on borrowed film sets for other active productions. The film spends most of its runtime in the bathroom location, and about 50% of filming was spent on those scenes. I went to bed in my shithole apartment and woke up in an actual shithole. So, the movie was released in theaters around Halloween in 2004, and I will never forget the explosion of popularity that this movie caused. I remember all of my friends sneaking into theaters to watch this movie when we were in middle school, and I remember the Billy the Puppet merch, and I remember the insane theory that Jigsaw was just Kevin McAllister all grown up. I remember all of it. I remember everything now. This movie's legacy was apparent from the very beginning. It was one of those instantly iconic films, and it especially hit at a time when slashers were petering out and audiences were looking for something new. This movie inspired movies like Hostel and Would You Rather, but it also launched the vast franchise of Saw movies that have followed in the 20 years since. Hell, it just got back to its roots with the recently released prequel sequel, Saw X, and that seems to really be making its own lane at the movie. The only thing I have not provided is your anesthetic, but trust me, you will want to remain alert. And not to mention that it opened the door for all of the incredible work that Juan and Juanel have been able to do off of the success of this movie. There is no debating that this movie has one hell of a legacy, and part of that is because of this scene right here. This kind of imagery was not only new to audiences, but it was downright terrifying. This movie had a sense of grit and truth and reality that makes it extremely hard to watch, yet impossible to look away from. The movie demands your attention with its kinetic and wild editing style and textured grain of the film stock and even the iconic voice of Jigsaw. Game over. <laughs> Which reminds me, the final twist of this movie really shook me and my friends the first time we saw it. While now, it takes a lot more to surprise an audience, at the time, the reveal that Jigsaw was in the room the entire time just felt like a huge shock. And while I don't know if it's really that impressive of a twist, it was romanticized so much at the time that I think it did help cement this film's legacy. Like, it's definitely on someone's list of best horror movie twists. You know, while the production schedule was extremely tight for this movie, James Wan still found a way to work in some of his signature style into the shots. According to Wan, he wanted the camera movements during the scenes to match the internal feelings of his characters. So you'll notice that many of the shots framing Carrie Elway's character, the shots are steady and smooth. But following that, the scenes framing Wan L's character are shaky and kinetic. This is meant to reinforce the idea that Adam is not as composed and calm as his cohort. Juan intentionally did this to help guide the character development, and obviously the same could be said for the film's editing. I think for a first-time duo, these two really showed a lot of confidence in their skills, and James Wan must have been feeling especially optimistic in the making of this movie, as he decided to forego a director's fee to instead get percentage points of the box office run. Honestly, that's bold, but if you ask Wan about the decision, he'll tell you that he doesn't regret it in the slightest. And why would he? Not only did the movie gross over a hundred million dollars, but that also means that his budget was able to be allocated to the production. So everybody wins. What else are you telling me? Well, um, let's see. And before we move on, let's see if you can answer this question. True or false, the iconic Billy Puppet was originally a children's ventriloquism dummy donated by Lee Wannell that he had as a child, and it was altered with a new wig and some face paint. Comment your answers down below. Actually, the puppet was built from scratch by Juan and Juanel for the film. It wasn't a modified version of anything existing, like say Michael Myers' iconic Captain Kirk mask. Oh. 
Okay folks, we've been through everything from the talented filmmakers behind this movie to the fortunate and fruitful release of the movie and even the mass impact that it's had on the genre in the years since. And I'm happy to say that the X Factor for this video was actually easier this time around than it has been in the past. While the movie is easy to praise solely based on the merits of its legacy, I think the standout of this movie is actually pretty clear because of the small scope. The stars had to really align in order for this movie to find its way onto the big screen. The idea was fresh and new, the filmmakers were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and the jaw trap scene that they demoed was scary and realistic enough to get the movie funded. But all of those things could have been meaningless to the franchise if it not had been for one thing. Billy the Puppet. <laughs> Billy is iconic in every sense of the word. Billy is a horror icon that isn't even alive. You can't compare him to anything because he's not a conscious thing. Like, Chucky is possessed, he's the villain. In Saw, Billy is just an extension of the villain. Jigsaw's the bad guy, and Billy is just a puppet. The most iconic f***ing puppet I've ever seen. Somehow, this little puppet that was only there for the sake of creepy imagery seems to be the marketing tool that has made each installment recognizable to the franchise. Tobin Bell is an amazing actor, and he's so amazing that we associate him with Billy, almost like he played dual roles. The puppet is just one of those icons that you know from your very first glance. And folks, let's never forget that Billy would kick this guy's ass. 